welcome to this video. Yeah, we're already covering round seven, the final round of the first turn. So this marks the the half. Yeah, we're, we're half through the whole event. And um, the game I'm going to show you here is uh, Swiddler playing wide against Anand. Swiddler on 50% after kind of a roller coaster tournament win loss win loss and with kind of with, with some weird weird games as well well Arnand has uh, won two games never was in trouble and uh, simply showing uh, his best performance uh, for ages so let's see what uh, happens in this game yeah another Berlin defense um, but I'm going to say uh, right right now that this is not a boring game, so <laughs> you shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, stop watching yet. Um, keep uh, keep tuned. It uh, it will be a good uh, a good interesting game. Yeah, as mentioned earlier, it feels a bit uh, a bit boring to have the Berlin all the time. As uh, as stated quite often, I understand why 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 they play it so often. But once in a while, why not try something else? Okay, yeah, Swiddler playing d3, the, this quiet line that avoids the, the end game. Bishop c5 and c3. Yeah, they often tried this also, also in this tournament. Uh, again, note that this is not on, losing a piece. But they tried something like that. This is what Andrekin, uh, for instance, played against Arnand in some, um, in uh, two, two rounds earlier, I believe. I wish he also got a good position as black, maybe had some winning chances even. Yeah, the c3 by Swiddler is um, the somewhat, <clears throat> I'm, yeah, I'm not sure if I should say ambitious move, but it simply keeps a bit more pieces on the board, tries to um, get to a more complex middle game. Yeah, all this is perfectly normal. And now Arnold plays knight e7. Now this is um, this idea is gaining uh, really lots of momentum. Um, we saw this earlier in the tournament in the game Andrekin with white against Kayakin. And um, in this game Andrekin played the move d4. Makes lots of sense of course kicking the bishop. And the idea became apparent after these moves that black will play d5 soon. Something like that. Is, uh, how it went in this game and black uh, already looks to be quite comfortable Swiddler avoided that he had tried d4 earlier in uh, in, in um, 2013 but okay he is going for rookie one keeping the tension in the in the center c6 bishop a4 and now Anand plays bishop b6 which te technically is a novelty but very normal move in, in other games they played this first but it does not make much of a difference bishop b6 d4 played and knight g6 in fact uh, this position has been played before just by um, a different uh, move order yeah and in this uh, position now swiddler plays the very normal looking move h3 and um I found a number of games uh, with this position, let's say like like 20 or so. And um, in, in this uh, position, black has tried all kinds of moves. Rook e8, for example, has been played just recently by Lenier Dominguez, the top Cuban player, or bishop c7, or all normal moves, <clears throat> all intending to just keep the status quo in the center and maybe prepare for d5 very long term plan to equalize completely in the center um, yeah and now Anand is coming up with an entirely new concept for this position and uh, I think it's actually a very good one um, maybe I, I'm not sure maybe it is a bit harsh to say but it it, it seems to render h3 somewhat uh, dubious in my, in my my book he took on d4 <laughs> surprisingly enough but we saw the general idea but um, let's see what happens here and now d5 of course yeah and um, okay here if you want to do anything uh, interesting as um, as white um, yeah you have to play e5 what else is there it's been, uh, did that 
um, something, oops, I'll keep doing that, um, something like that, for example, black um, really just recaptures and gets a very comfortable isolated pawn position. This is not great and the bishop here is also not great. Um, I mean, white is not in, in, in big trouble here or something, but it's simply not what you want. Swindler played e5 and uh, this got answered by um, e5. This got answered by knight h5. A very uh, interesting idea by, uh, by Arnold. Getting a knight quickly getting a knight quickly to f4. Some of the software is uh, having some glitches here. It's a bit strange. Knight h5. Yeah, intending to to get to f4. And um, yeah, very often in the in the open games, a knight arriving on f4 or on f5 is uh, is a real nuisance. And uh, black just managed to get um, get this in the knight to f4. Um, to be honest, I already believe that white is uh, is worse, <laughs> and this is uh, very weird. I mean, it's a, it's a well known position, like uh, played as mentioned like uh, twenty times, and no one came up with that. And it's uh, it took some time. He probably had this, maybe he had this idea over the board, or he was just rechecking his analysis. I'm not sure, but uh, this is already very very tricky for white to play. You always have those knights near your king, and um, it does not. It does not really. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not really much fun to play. Yeah, played knight to f1. Um, a funny move to look at is g3. Trying to really cover this square, and uh, hoping <coughs> or banking on this on this idea. Bishop takes knight h2 to attack the knight and claim that uh, black has no good way to cover it. After this, there is um, yeah this move for instance, and it's indeed um, good for white. But uh, black um, has a far better move here. He can just take on e g3. This is uh, leading to complete disaster, and quickly <laughs> something like that. Check. It's just um, just losing for white. A terrible position. Yeah, g3 is. Um, just an attempt uh, to to quickly end the game, but not in your favor. Yeah, he played knight f1. Looks very natural move, like a very natural move, getting the knight over, covering some squares on the king side, and freeing the c1 bishop. Yeah, and uh, okay, this move is sort of um, clear. What else? And uh, yeah, what is white supposed to do now? This is just a super annoying piece. The computer at first um, gives this as about equal, which really surprised me. And uh, after a while it agrees that uh, black is just better. Here, and then f6. This is the, the big problem. Black will um, almost always have f6 in addition to all of that and be able to attack this uh, spearhead pawn. And if white is forced to take, then even the f-file is opening up. And uh, Another very big issue is that the d4 pawn is just weak here. Black is always attacking it with those minor pieces and um, white um, is really not having any sort of direct counterplay. This is um, a very, very uncomfortable position. Yes, Swidler didn't take, which I very much understand, um, even giving up the bishop pair on top of all of that. He played bishop c2 after a very long thought. And uh, he was visibly uncomfortable. I had the chance to watch some of the, the live uh, video coverage. And um, yeah, well, it's really uh, terrible to be in this spot after 15 moves with white. And you're really not, uh, you, you don't really know what, what we did wrong. It, it looks like completely normal, everything up to here. But um, maybe white needs to improve somewhere here. I, I really don't know. Around here, black is already better and um, has very easy play even. The next move is very clear, f6. Yeah? You attack the center, the central pawn. The knight on g6 is also nicely placed to to increase the pressure on e5. And um, yeah, it's, it's very tough to give white advice. If you, for instance, just take it, yeah, black takes with the queen. And uh, now it uh, it gets really uh, ugly 
there are numerous sacrificial ideas of course for this knight computer actually wants to grab on c6 now and play this position which is a disaster and the the, the worst thing is that you have no counterplay whatsoever as white absolutely none this is also a swiller um i probably think i never really considered to take on f6 um i think um he did relatively speaking the best thing possible he played knight to g3 um and um after f takes e5 which is also quite uh, quite an obvious move um he took on g6 not not a happy move absolutely not but uh, what what should what else should you do just just uh, to consider what 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 could happen now if, if he takes here with the pawn yeah there's there's even this coming immediately okay check check yeah, and white will, will get mated in short order. Yeah, there, there's so much pressure already on the on the king. You uh, you cannot really play any 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 second rate moves anymore. Something like that. Okay. Besides the direct uh, sacrifices, there's also queen f6. Check is also winning very quickly. It's just a, a vicious attack. You need to reduce. Um, the, the peace count near the king. And this is why after the capture on e5, he played this as mentioned, not uh, especially aesthetic, but <laughs> what what else is there? Aesthetic move to capture. Now black retook, bishop g5, gaining at least the tempo. Yeah, if you um, look at knight e5 here, this is a bit better than uh, in the position before, but um, it's also not helping. And it absolutely leaves you without any counterplay yeah you probably need to do do this and uh, the problem is that this rook on e5 now is uh, somewhat stranded um, something like here and bishop to c7 will probably win the exchange the rook has no square yes yeah, Swidler played bishop g5 which i think is is the best try queen c7 Quite logical and now knight takes e5 was played yeah and we are coming near a very critical position now um Arnold captured rook takes yeah and here um, maybe you should look at this position for a moment and consider what move um, should black seriously think about it's not a move that uh, i can i can tell you that um, immediately it's not a move that is winning the game but uh, just to maybe improve your tactical vision what move should um, black calculate here give you a couple of seconds okay i'm going to show you the move um the interesting move here is rook takes f2 something that um, comes quite naturally to to a stronger player who um, has looked at the position simply because you you feel that there's something critical happening on this diagonal and you would immediately check those uh, sacrifices i mean it's not a tax sacrifice in terms of giving up material but like those um those uh, flashy moves you would uh, check immediately yeah anand took lots of time in this position here and uh, i can tell you right away he didn't take so why didn't he take yeah let's start with the easy things i mean this is quite clear that black is uh, just winning here he gained a pawn even two bishops weak pawn weak king easy yeah this is easy but um white can indeed fight on in this position and um, with some um, yeah some justification he can uh, give this check. check this is the critical line that anand certainly calculated now you cannot move the king yeah this this is check yeah out of the question you need to play the rook back yeah and here check. white will capture and okay he's a pawn down but uh, if you consider this let's say white plays this move king h2 it's not so nice to get into the self pin but you probably don't have 
anything much better. And it's not such a big deal, the south pin, as white is going to play queen to d2 and possibly bishop f4. Um, we can continue this line just for with these two moves that are very natural. And um, this position is in fact much trickier than it looks. At first sight, if you spot the move rook f2, my initial reaction was, I mean, I also saw it like instantly that you can take. And I thought, oh, isn't Wishy just winning here? Is it, since it's dead? And uh, no, well, the thing is, check, check. this is really forced. And here, it's not so clear how black is uh, going to uh, going to play. I mean, let's let's consider just for argument's sake, something like that. Yeah, the, he's got this ideas, queen here, of let's say bishop c7. Yeah, going rook e1. There is uh, there is some compensation on the dark squares like that, and um, maybe um, Anand wasn't one hundred percent sure if this is uh, so great. Especially if you consider, if you look at the game, the game continuation, he played after, if you look at this, huh, he took took some minutes, he played h6. And um, if you look at this, it, it's also looking like a very, very good position for black. It's not like um, this rook f2 was uh, an out of the blue single kind of chance that you should take uh, because it um, it's, it's not going to... Uh, there's no, no good alternative. H6 was also a very uh, good move. I mean, in terms of um, keeping keeping an advantage. Black already has the better structure and the bishop pair. You don't need to uh, do anything fancy um, immediately. Yeah, H6. Now Swiddler played bishop H4. Looks like a strange move, but... Uh, but uh, you need to do it. If you play uh, bishop e3, normal looking move, there is queen f7, keeping an eye on the square again, and bishop c7 is the threat, basically trapping the rook and winning the exchange. Right cannot avoid that, really. You will win the exchange here. So bishop to h4 was played. Yeah, and here um, you can uh, calculate all kinds of uh, crazy things. One one possible thing is after this um, this queen move, or you can start here with g5 just to to be complete about it. Here white can sacrifice something you don't want to try, but after queen f7, which is what Arnon played, Swiller went knight h5. Here the computer actually uh, suggests the move g5, which is. Uh, for a human player, completely insane to consider. I mean, <laughs> I'm always amazed uh, what uh, what the engines come up with. If you just consider this this position, I can assure you that no human player is going to do that as black. Bishop g5. Check. Queen takes with check. Okay. Sidestepping. Check. Yeah, and I, I gave the computer about a minute here to evaluate this position. And uh, it's a pretty pretty strong computer. Um, Houdini 4 on a, on a quad core and so on. So not like I'm using a smartphone here. And it gives then 0 0.5 for black. <laughs> so a slight edge for black. So what, what kind of evaluation is that? Um, the thing is, if you are a human being and you see that, uh, well, your king is uh, out in the open and white is attacking with all those pieces, I mean... Mm. It's just nothing. You don't play that, especially if you um, if you have um, a, a simple continuation <clears throat> that is not um, anywhere near as, as risky. He played bishop to e6, completing development. But now rook e3. Yeah, but um, white. I mean, white's position looks a bit clumsy, but he has quite a number of pieces near the king. And um, yeah, it's I mean, rook g3 needs to be considered carefully as f2 hangs. But yeah, all pieces are somewhere somewhere near the king. And if you give white um, a num yeah, number of kind of free moves to improve, this is, um, this is not so bad. Now bishop d8 was played. And um, yeah, the idea is that after the capture, Check. You have f2 again. And here Swiddler played rook f3. Yeah, now in this position, Anand went for an interesting idea. And uh, 
I guess he was maybe he was uh, aiming for that even and uh, thought that maybe he has some some chances in this position. He um, now sacrifices queen with queen takes f3. Yeah, after the capture, he took on h4. So he got rook and uh, bishop for the queen. And um, it is imaginable that he maybe thought um, he has something as black uh, because uh, all those pawns are, are vulnerable. You got a bishop pair and you don't, your coordination as black is not uh, terribly, uh, terribly bad. Um, but nevertheless, um, comparing it to some other positions that uh, we, we looked at, Probably the the, the spot was uh, this, the the big spot for improvement was still bishop, uh, rook takes f two, to to get this uh, important pawn and uh, hang on to it. In this uh, in this position, it turns out that um, Swidler after king g two, and this moves. Yeah, he covered f three with the rook from the side, and then after a couple of more moves, he started counterplay on the queen side, and it simply seems that Black is not uh, managing to attack those pawns in a in a way that white cannot defend them anymore. The counterplay on the queen side here is coming really quickly. Look at this. Swidler is insisting on, on simplifying the position and I believe rightly so. White, white has absolutely no winning chances in this position. He um, simply needs to be careful that uh, there is nothing nothing terrible happening on one of those pawns. And uh, well after b5 we see that this is traded and um, yeah white simply has this idea of a counter sacrifice here after bishop c6 Swidler took on c6 and uh, after these moves they agree to a draw he will just take a6 and of course there's nothing to do in this position black is just um, completely um, fine fine as a completely coordinated <clears throat> and he can if everything else fails simply always play something like that and uh, get the f3 pawn back yeah it's um this 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 uh, queen sacrifice was um was interesting but uh, not sufficient to do anything in terms of an advantage it's uh, probably really the case that uh, maybe you can find something around here. It still looks like, I mean, g5, <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe you can still find something around here. But uh, I, I still believe that uh, the crucial position was really here, where rook takes f2 is probably the move you uh, you must play. And I, I'm pretty certain that if we were in a situation here, in the tournament situation, where Anand needed needed to win the game at all costs, he would have taken. I'm very sure, but um, he probably maybe he saw some some more compensation that White actually uh, would have gotten. I mean, this is not like check check. Yeah, as I as I had shown, this is really some compensation. It's not like White is just a pawn down for absolutely nothing, but maybe he overestimated that. I believe that uh, Black has. Still, quite good uh, good chances to um, to use this um, extra pawn in the end, but I understand it from a human perspective. This uh, might look tricky to you, very uh, very understandable. Yeah, okay, certainly a game where Arnold's position right out of the opening was uh, was excellent, but uh, maybe he really needed to um, to um, yeah follow it up with this capture on f two. To, uh, to make a whole point out of that. Not without taking uh, some risks, but okay, he's in a very comfortable tournament situation um, and uh, it's really understandable that, that he didn't want to risk too much. Yeah, okay, let's uh, do a quick summary for both players uh, after this first part of the tournament. Um, or let's say um, um, an evaluation of, uh, of, the, of the standings. Swidler is on 50% after this up and down a roller coaster ride, win loss, and so on. Yeah, 50% is not a hopeless situation. If you compare it, Arnold is on plus two. So this is just one point difference. It's not like he's out of the picture, but uh, he has made some quite uh, quite weird decisions <laughs> already. If you remember this h6 move against Mahmoud Yarov, which just blundered the g6 pawn out of a position where he was maybe um, even slightly better um, just before it. 
Um, he certainly could have uh, gotten more points. That's uh, no no question, but he's not completely out of out of the race. Well, Arnold is um, in a very comfortable spot. He's got um, these two wins, no loss. He was never ever close to to even being worse. And um, of course, there is the all important game tomorrow in uh, round eight, where we have uh, the return game with Aronian playing white against uh, Arnold. Aronian, the pre-tournament favorite. And note that Anand has won the first game against Aronian. So if he would manage a draw, let's just be conservative here and say Anand draws his black against Aronian, then he would have the better tie break because he won the mini match one and a half to zero and a half. And uh, winning the mini match means if they would finish on equal points after this whole 14 rounds, then uh, Anand would qualify due to the better tiebreak having won their match, which is, I think, a very fair tiebreak. I mean, you can always argue about those uh, mathematical things like, okay, he did win against whom and somewhat. This is uh, always a bit, um, a bit like black magic. But um, if it would end in this way, Anand and Aronian finish on equal and Anand won this game, okay, then it's certainly a fair deal. Yeah, this will be super important tomorrow. And i um, looking forward to, to cover that game and watch it. <laughs> All right, thanks for watching this video. Till tomorrow.